Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to come and speak to you this evening. Um, hopefully you'll find my research interesting. So I'll, I've broadly called this talk, Small Mediums, How Spiritualist Reality Became Gothic Fiction. So what I'm gonna talk about is kind of the character of the female medium, how we write about them and why we write about them. And I'll also touch on the roots of these literary tropes and why the idea of the young female child medium kind of continues to unsettle us throughout the years. Now, this won't be a, a slideshow of books. This isn't a reading list, but more of a kind of how we got here and why. So why Carrie exists, how Victorian mediums inadvertently sculpted these stereotypes and why every medium that we see in contemporary literature is always somewhat familiar. So this is a talk about women. Now, if we look at the role of the medium, the, the role and the perceived necessity of the spiritual medium is hard to place within Victorian popular culture, but also in terms of business and societal status. So whether mediums exist within the interface between science and religion, or if they exist independently of the two, is a question partially grounded in an individual's belief in the legitimacy of the medium themselves. However, the influence of descriptions of these mediums' femininity and the appealing or unappealing physicality um, of these 19th century mediums on genre fiction and contemporary Gothic, on horror literature, is completely undeniable. Now, while Victorian mediumship may conjure up themes of spiritual uncertainty and horror, many young, predominantly female mediums acted as a kind of catalyst for so many social, cultural and literary ideas. Now, this was where the finality of death was uprooted, often by the work of an unmarried, working to lower middle class woman and not through established educated authorities. So these women are reinterpreted repeatedly into the fictional characters that entice us into so much contemporary neo-Gothic literature. Now, Many contemporary depictions of Victorian seances and spirit materializations can be traced back to reports of two very different individuals who I'm sure most of you will be very familiar with, these being Elizabeth Agnes Guppy and Florence Cook. Now between them, these women not only represented, not only represented, beg your pardon, but lived out the experience of the Virgin and the Crone now, each lie at opposing ends of the spectrum of femininity, defined by their sexuality or sexlessness, respectively, and are regarded as the beginning and end result of the male circle of desire and marriage. So their very legitimacy as mediums was partially dictated by their reproductive value to men. So, for example, most young literary mediums that we see in contemporary Gothic can be traced back to the ubiquitous written reports of Florence Cook in particular. Now, not just considering the written word, the wider cultural impact that Cook left in the public consciousness is really underappreciated in literary criticism. Now, the cookie cutter female medium didn't spring from collective imaginations, but from a lived reality proliferated by the early age of celebrity and periodical culture. Now, ultimately, I believe that several mediums can be grouped under these two banners of the Virgin and the Crone. Um, but I generally use Cook and Guppy as key easy reference points due to their kind of comparative celebrity in the 1870s, that being the heyday of modern spiritualism. But for brevity's sake, uh, those that I would group under the Virgin banner are mediums that, again, will probably be very, very familiar to you. Mediums such as Florence Cook, Cora Scott, Nettie Coburn Maynard, and Kate and Margaret Fox to an extent. And whereas I would approximate the crone to include such familiar names as Mrs. Guppy once more, Helen Duncan, Doris Stokes, and Doris Collins in recent years, and tenuously Madame Blavatsky, but I try not to do too much crossover with uh, theosophy. So to formalise things, the idea of the virgin and the crone are two types of fictional medium that we most commonly see today. So drawing direct lines back to their progenitors in reality 
helps us to see the literary landscape of fictional mediums for what it is, which is wholly uninventive. Now, Florence Cook, she was young, virginal and dainty when she entered the arena of spiritualism. And through this purity, her connection to angels and spirits was seen as stronger, but it also provided an added visual appeal to male sitters. She was untouched and physically pure, but filled with arcane knowledge. In spiritualist periodicals of the time, accounts of her mediumship are preceded by descriptors of her, of her youthful beauty. So Florence is referred to as a trim little lady of sweet 16, young, lithe and charming, and petite, pretty and dark. Now, Mrs Guppy was older, had been married and was therefore sexually mature, having lost her innocence in the process. However, her lack of physical appeal increased her perceived legitimacy as a medium. So her age and body made her sexless to an extent and therefore a viable spiritual catalyst. Now, let's, let's see where we go. So Florence is kind of the spiritualist medium that we see in contemporary genre fiction. This is what we're most familiar with today in bookshelves. So if we take Ray Russell's The Case Against Satan from 1962, John Coyne's The Piercing from 79, Ramsey Campbell's The Parasite from 81, and James Herbert's Shrine from 84. They all rely on the subversion of delicate pubescent or prepubescent femininity via spiritual intervention. So the Parasite and Shrine in particular focus on the ultimate corruption in general as being young girls burdened with powers of mediumship and spiritual slash psychic power. Now in Shrine, the deaf mute protagonist, Alice Paget is cured and imbued with the gifts of mediumship and faith healing, which raises her status above that of the patriarchal social structure around her and also importantly, the clergy. So the fear of Alice comes as much from her supernatural powers as it does from the subversion of social structures. Her abilities elevate her above her station which was previously tethered by sex and age. So most of our contemporary understanding of child or at least very young mediumship has evolved. Thank you, Tarden. Um, from these descriptions of child mediumship in paperback fiction from the 60s to the 90s. Now these women, they bristled with untapped sexuality such as teenager Susan Garth in Ray Russell's The Case Against Satan whose pubescent sexual desires incite demonic visitation and interrogate the moral, ethical and sexual resolve of the men around her. Whereas conversely, it's the piety of teenager Betty Sue that leads to spiritual and demonic visitation in John Coyne's novel, The Piercing. Both ultimately result in the spiritual and sexual downfall of the male protagonist proving the young women to be corruptive in both their sexual and spiritual acts. Much like Florence Cook and the investigating scientist William Crookes, the woman incites a potential sexuality into a medium investigator relationship. Now this duality of desirable and undesirable feminine is established in Victorian sensibility where the feminine ideal was that of the angel in the house being self-sacrificing, fertile, sympathetic, and doting on her husband. Now, the legitimacy of womanhood directly links to a woman's physicality, where the dainty, young, and delicate were celebrated in the middle-class domestic environment, much like the unwed and physically delicate Florence Cook in her early years. Now, Miss Havisham in Dickens's Great Expectations from 1861 is an exercise in the corruptive non-femininity of living women, such as Mrs Guppy. Now, Havisham is a relic in the house she inhabits. Although living, she haunts the space with her corruptive lack of femininity, defined by her inability to wed and produce progeny. She is a social outcast and has wasted her fertility and so is no longer trustworthy or of use to her family or to wider society. 
Now, while many older female mediums had families of their own, their age and lack of physical attraction offset any proof of sexual maturity. And such figures as Guppy were similarly seen as kind of untrustworthy antiquities. Now, in literature, Florence Cook, reaching immense fame, aged only 15, embodies the innocent young woman with powers beyond her understanding. She crackles with sexual potential and untapped power, but has become kind of the genre template for possessed children and deceptive beauty. Now, Cook was too young and pure for deception. Guppy was too old and fat. So this duality of respectability and spiritual legitimacy versus sexual appeal can be applied across most women in supernatural fiction, gothic fiction, or even horror in general. Now, Elizabeth, known primarily as Mrs. or Agnes Guppy, um, is the antithesis of young Florence. So Mrs. Guppy was renowned for her hardiness in the face of investigation. She was tough, determined, ruthless, and even her own biographer described her as a fat and unpleasant woman, a great pretender and an arch deceiver, a fake medium, we still go on, a cheat, and an opportunist of the actress type. Now, while she materialized flowers and kittens from the ether, she also planned very violent attacks against her younger competitors. So her career, her very being, has been treated reductively and often dismissively by future authors. Guppy's legacy lives on now in deceptive portly fortune tellers, bitter old crones and widows out for financial manipulation. Now, Mrs. Guppy famously made an enemy of Florence Cook, kind of rooted in her popularity, her youth and her good looks. In January 1873, Mrs. Guppy cons conspired to bring together a group of people to attend one of Cook's seances, whereby, I quote, while the manifestations were in progress, they would throw vitrol, meaning acid, in the face of the spirit, hoping to destroy forever the handsome features of Miss Florence Cook. And Guppy is later quoted as attacking Cook's doll face, treating her looks as a viable target of her rage. Now, in other seances, Guppy's spirits violently settled grievances, tarring and feathering a former friend, Mrs. Berry, in one such seance. And aside from Guppy's malicious and godlike control of her seance arena, it infers that not only was it Florence's looks rather than her mediumistic abilities that were a threat to Guppy, but that her looks were integral to her success and her continuing career as a public figure in spiritualism. Now, both Guppy and Cook were mistrusted, celebrated and criticised for reasons primarily rooted in their sexuality and femininity. Now, both mediums were successful, reaching legendary status in their lifetime, but their wider literary influence has also been forgotten over time. Both contemporary and contemporaneous texts draw heavily on the lives of these women and others like them as well, thus creating the mediumistic tropes that we utilize today. Now, the discussion of Guppy's body was not confined to accounts of her seances where she would hide spirit apports beneath her clothing, but in completely unrelated discourse in the letter pages of newspapers and periodicals. Now, rebutting comments from investigator Walter Thornbury that she was not simply fraudulent, but fat. Guppy's husband published an extensive and frustrated letter in the Daily News stating, with equal importance to her spiritual abilities, that my wife is not fat. It is all good solid flesh with very little bone, which is one of my favorite quotes of all time. And Samuel Guppy's correspondence with the spiritualist in regard to a slight on his medium wife's name is yet another perfect demonstration of how letters to the editor pages became little more than like a public forum for grudges and wages to be settled. Now, in this one instance, um, Mrs. Guppy's physicality was insulted in a previous letter in order to denigrate her status and legitimacy as a spirit medium, further proving that a woman's body was never separate from her spiritual viability or professional achievements. 
Now, while a husband may indeed be attempting to protect his wife's feelings, it's clear that a medium's legitimacy is not free from sexual politics and is ultimately decided by the idea of men and their perceived eroticism of the subject. Now, Guppy's likeness can be seen most clearly in Hilary Mantel's Beyond Black uh, from 2005. It's a very good book, I recommend it. Now, Alison, the aging medium, is portrayed as a, as a corruptive and deceptive character. Um, qualities that were tightly linked with her attractiveness or lack thereof. Uh, where her larger size is a tool for repulsion. She is not only big and wobbling, but of an unfeasible size with plump, creamy shoulders, rounded calves, thighs, and hips that overflowed her chair. Her diet is chronicled as junk food, I expect, empty calories, stuffing yourself, with the results kind of emphasized at every turn throughout the novel. Um, following a photo shoot, where the studio had mysteriously disappeared two of her chins. It was a great example of that. Her larger size and mediumistic ability are shown to subsequently be symbiotic or codependent at least, where the medium claims that she needed cake and chocolate bars to pad her flesh and keep her from the pinching of the dead, their peevish nipping and needle teeth. Now her outward appearance reiterates the distasteful nature of her character. She's not only unattractive, but an even greater sin for a woman. She's old. Now her use to the world around her is at its thinnest point, yet she dares to command power. Now the vilification of the medium in most works of fiction can be seen through the distribution of power whether it be through bodily autonomy, wealth, or commodification. The medium possesses power of herself, her bodily autonomy and her sexuality, through ghostly misdirection and through the control of the seance arena, which were commonly domestic spaces. Now, should the use of such spaces be given over to spiritualist business dealings, whereby a monetary fee was necessary, the medium would enter a realm of disrespectability the likes of which were reserved for actresses and others of questionable moral fibre. By becoming public with their mediumship, women were designated as working women and unable to live up to the statutes of Johnson's ideas of true womanhood, which were in their infancy at the time. Now, interrogating Franklin Johnson's ideas of true womanhood and the roles of performance, uh, Elizabeth Schaber Lowry, a fantastic academic, states that public speaking was counter to natural feminine predilections and a public woman constituted a public threat. Moreover, once a woman had sullied herself by entering the public sphere, there was no turning back. Now, a woman desiring to be on the public stage already suggested that she was other from her gender, desiring to occupy a traditionally masculine space. Now, my research led to the discovery of of wider questions on the nature of Victorian feminine respectability as discussed in True Womanhood. Now here, Johnson argues the wider damaging effects of women holding court, listing the reasons for women's interest in the field as such. One is a desire to taste the intoxication of public applause. The agitation gives rise to large assemblies, to debate, to discuss in the press and promises, if, success if successful, to lead women to the bar, to the pulpit, to the arena of political strife, into office, and some are enamoured with the prospect. So mediums were dangerous women. Now in the anonymously titled Maud Blount from 1876 and Zilla Child Medium from 1857, spiritualism and a desire to contact spirits is unveiled as not so much a knowing moral trickery, but a kind of temporary loss of the senses, discarded when a woman comes of age or marries into an appropriate family. There is no unknown, only moralistic resolution. Now, in both Maud and Zilla, both novels end in marriage as a means of putting an end to the medium's involvement in spiritualism and, in turn, her involvement in business. Now, this signalled a return to true womanhood. 
In Zilla, this return is through her narrow avoidance of marriage to an evil spiritualist and subsequent marriage into clergy, Mr. Godwin, very excitingly titled man. Now, while this may indeed be a brazen reference to God winning or returning to the lives of the spiritualist, it may also be a reference to Mary Godwin Shelley. Now, in her 1818 publishing of Frankenstein, she similarly portrayed an instance of man attempting to supersede God and suffering horribly as a result. Now, similarly, Mary Shelley's father, William Godwin, may have been directly referenced by name in Zilla. Now, while Godwin was renowned for his political works and secular beliefs, his marriage to Mary Shelley's mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, was equally infamous. Due to Wollstonecraft's radical feminist beliefs, she was regarded as a threat to traditional femininity and therefore potentially a subject to be kind of controlled, remoulded and re-educated by Godwin. And following Florence Cook's marriage, uh, first marriage to Captain Corner, everyone expected her to renounce her mediumship as her husband would surely not be supportive of such things. And initially she did withdraw from public life following this first marriage, an act which spiritualists expected but lamented at the time, writing, now she is married, she is no more amongst us. However, Marlene Trump explains that spiritualism made social violations of all kinds possible and respectable because it blurred the boundaries between the spiritual and the material. Now, that isn't to say that Cook shouted her nuptials from the rooftops, but she did rather conceal this first marriage when writing to her patron, Charles Blackburn, for some time after they were wed. Similarly, during and following the, the pseudoscientific investigations of William Crookes, allegations of an affair and improper conduct were famously rife. Now, despite mediums such as Florence Cook and Cora Scott having several marriages, the anonymously authored novel Zilla, The Child Medium, suggests that many young mediums prefer spiritual over sexual intercourse and subsequently will not marry, reproduce and carry on their line. This othered medium being young, beautiful, but not sexually available is a common trope throughout much contemporary literature and filmmaking. Now, this is an interpretation that seems distinctly modern, crafted from Ouija-style horror films, but is a view as old as spiritualism itself. The sense of the unruly woman having a place in spiritualism is hammered home within the pages of Zilla as characters within the story make a trip to a spiritual tent revival where a number of dangerous women are noted and these are namely women who were fighting for gender rights. Now, while anonymously authored and relatively unknown today, these works of fiction were both popular interpretations of mediumship. They also offer a cultural and historical snapshot into changing public views as to the social role of a young unmarried woman gaining traction through mediumship. Now, unlike more contemporary works such as Affinity by Sarah Waters, Beyond Black by Hilary Mantel, or even Muriel Sparks' The Bachelors, works such as Zilla and Maud were constructed alongside the movement as it was in its, in its early days. And these real women as well were, were springing up alongside them. And so they were, they were writing what they saw rather than constructing these narratives uh, retrospectively. Now, in Maud, um, Maud is a widow at the age of 18 and increases her mediumistic ability after meeting and marrying a young clergyman. So the involvement of clergy itself isn't a barrier to mediumship. This is something that seems to be erased from many contemporary works. Maud continues to spend her days alone in trance-like communion with her dead father. Now, after her and her husband's first son dies, which her husband blames on spiritualism, she renounces spiritualism, she has a daughter who lives, and all other mediums within the book are shown to be frauds. And Maud's mother similarly follows suit. She renounces spiritualism and marries once again into the church. Everybody's happy. Now, in Maud, 
which was published anonymously in 1876. It later came to light that it was authored by Charles Morris Davis, who was actually an Anglican clergyman, whose wife had become enamored with spiritualism, namely automatic writing. Now, Maud follows the story of a, a young lady just emerging from her teens, whose involvement with spiritualism and seance alongside her mother's tutoring leads her to a good man who takes her out of the morally compromising field of mediumship. Zilla, child medium, was also published anonymously in 1857 and is more of a, a romantic melodrama than a, a real exploration of spiritualism and its effects. Now, Zilla, the child medium, channels her mother's spirit and no good comes of it in that good old miserable Victorian way. Now, her governess, Rachel, uh, being of lower class, also develops mediumistic powers and becomes a rather tragic figure throughout. But as with every single woman in all of these books, she goes on to marry a good man who takes her out of the realms of mediumship and out of individual earning potential. Now, in these two books, mediumship is the realm of the single woman. And if practiced in marriage, it can only bring misfortune, trouble, death and a tarnished reputation. Now, Rachel, the governess, only marries following the death of her spoiler medium friend Zilla and Maud can only mother a living child after renouncing her craft. In reality both Florence Cook and Mrs Guppy continued their mediumship well into their married lives. Guppy was widowed and Cook endured some rather traumatic divorces but it takes no stretch of the imagination to think that these works were comments on the impossibility of a godly marriage and the mediumistic sideline. Now, like many others who fell at the gates before Florence Cook, Maud Blount summarises the feelings of the day with a very clumsy moralistic clause spoken over the dinner table. We all, male and female, went in more or less for mania into spiritualism when we were single and became clothed and in our right mind soon after we were married. Now, appearance, although inconsequential in mediumistic practice itself, is one of the key elements that has trickled down into these contemporary fictional depictions of women in the seance arena. Now in Zilla, the spiritualist tent scene is rife with really beautiful, vivid depictions of young mediums. One is described as having eyes glittering with the mild, innocent splendor of childhood. Now such a description would not be out of place in descriptions of Cook and her contemporaries, where childlike descriptions are celebrated as the pinnacle of celebrated young womanhood. Now, in one instance, her friend and fellow medium, Rosina, is described as plump, attractive and fair with a dreamy look in her eyes. And as before in the fictional Zilla, one medium is complimented on her femininity and pleasing appearance, being very beautiful with a fierce, savage beauty. Yet immediately afterwards, via her association with this spiritualist gathering, she is dismissed as a tainted and unwanted woman, little more than, than a prostitute at the time. And they say that at a glance you saw she was one of those women whom men very often admire most, yet never by any chance desire to marry. Now, the medium's adult body is the aspect that makes her truly undesirable and no longer attractive to contemporary writers of neo-Gothic or horror fiction. It's the medium's childlike qualities and glittering eyes that are celebrated. Childhood suggests her legitimacy as a spiritualist, whereas her stature is viewed only as a barrier to marriage. Now, many of the early sections of Maud Blount are dedicated to Maud and her mother's beauty with no narrative or situational need for such descriptions. Maud is a splendid specimen with glossy and luxuriant raven locks with slow black eyes. She is a model of rare, ripe womanhood. Her actions are immature and unrefined due to cosseting from her parents, but her beauty maintains her relevance in society and her viability as a medium and as a future wife. Now, in descriptions of Florence Cook, her childlike demeanour is matched only by her lithe frame, celebrated once again as the pinnacle of piety and virginity. 
William Crooks, who's on the screen now, um, who was, where was I? William Crooks in his investigations of Florence slash Katie, Florence being the medium, Katie being her manifested spirits, recorded that photography is as inadequate to depict the perfect beauty of Katie's face as words are powerless to describe her charm of manner. It cannot reproduce the brilliant purity of her complexion or the ever varying expression of her most mobile features. Now, indeed, this would be wildly improper for a married man to be speaking of a young girl like this, but Crooks was not talking about young Florence, but Katie, the ghost. So it's all above board and his wife had absolutely nothing to worry about. Therefore, Florence's abilities as a manifestation medium are secured and Crooks is not accused of having impure thoughts against his long suffering wife and family. Now the differences between the manifested spirit and the medium were similarly recorded extensively across spiritualist periodicals presented as a scientific fact thanks to the authorship of Crooks himself. In 1874, he wrote that Katie's height varies in my house, I have seen her six inches taller than Miss Cook. Last night, with bare feet and not tiptoeing, she was four and a half inches taller than Miss Cook. Katie's neck was bare last night. The skin was perfectly smooth, both to touch and sight, whilst on Miss Cook's neck is a large blister, which sounds very pleasant, which under similar circumstances is distinctly visible and rough to the touch. Now, after such a claim of difference in texture and examining her within his own household, it is no surprise that closeness between the medium and her investigator was questioned. He goes on to say that Katie's ears were unpierced, whilst Miss Cook habitually wears earrings. Katie's complexion is very fair. This bear in mind Katie's the ghost, Cook's the medium. Whilst that of Miss Cook is very dark. Katie's fingers are much longer than Miss Cook's and her face is also larger. In manners and ways of expression, there are also many decided differences. Now, such minor and arguably invented differences between the women are laughable by most standards, being presented with such scientific assurance, but are unimpressive and weak when interrogated. Now, before this, Florence, following the retirement or farewell of Katie's spirit in May of 1874, had attempted a secondary later manifestation in the form of a gypsy named Marie. Now, Marie only lasted a few seances uh, until February 1880, when she was exposed once more by a young man named George Sitwell. Now, after deducing that the dancing gypsy spirit was wearing a robe over visible stays, the medium, then working under the name of Mrs. Corner, um, was revealed to be dancing in her underwear. And the medium, now free from childhood, cannot escape this adult shame of nudity, a nudity that only appears in contemporary literature when it serves a deceptive or sexual purpose, as in Sarah Waters' affinity, which we'll get to in a minute. But why do we keep seeing mediumship as a popular trope within Gothic and horror literature. Well, the body of the medium affords the writer more freedom of creativity than a regular woman, a regular girl. She doesn't have to be a character. She doesn't have to be three dimensional, nor meet the same modern moral or ethical representations of womanhood, all things that would ordinarily concern a writer, especially writers with large audiences who would be familiar with a tighter lens of, of criticism nowadays. Now, instead, the medium is both defined by and denied her gender and by extension, her autonomy, becoming little more than another narrative device or another vessel. As much as a medium's body is celebrated, it's not her own. A medium in a trance is denied a sense of self as it is superseded by the other that inhabits her. Conventions of politeness, morals and societal norms are put aside by a sense of scientific investigative othering, where women may be physically investigated, stripped and restrained. Now it's through investigations and monitored seances, shall we say, that women are most clearly denied autonomy and agency. 
the woman's body is a tool to be examined, free from conventions of Victorian decency. A report from a turn of the century seance explains this suspension in societal norms. I quote, the ladies are invited into the cabinet to disrobe her. And in later instances, the ladies at her seances are allowed to thoroughly examine her clothing and her person. Similarly, in an account of a seance led by Mrs. Guppy in 1872, it's recorded that first the room was searched by the gentleman while Mrs. Guppy was being undressed and redressed in the presence of Mrs. Trollope, every article of her dress being closely examined. Now, McGarry introduces a seance from 1868 that further explores the eroticism and sexual politics of seance, especially in terms of materialized spirits. Now, after being called to a materialized spirit within a cabinet seance, a young man, I quote, goes forward nearly to the curtain and is whispered to, embraced and very audibly kissed. And the spirit then goes back behind the curtain but reappears again for a moment to exchange some more kisses. So questions of gender arise and the possibilities of same sex interactions are introduced in accounts of the same medium, where a similar performance is gone through with another sitter, a young woman who is so excited at being kissed that she nearly faints away, the kissing being very animated and prolonged. Now, one undeniable aspect of female mediumship in contemporary literature is that of the young girl on the brink of puberty, whose period signals the formation and development of her, of her psychic or mediumistic powers. Now this transition from unassuming child to othered woman comes at the point of menstruation, an act which under many a contemporary horror lens makes a girl impure and no longer viable for pure Christian representation, but becomes a viable catalyst for spiritual intervention and by extension, uh, deception. Now, in reality, Florence Cook, the teenage medium whose abilities came into question following her natural maturing and marriage, has been reinterpreted several times over in most extreme manifestations in the 70s and 80s. Now, grouped with Cook, other such young mediums have all fed into the representation of the corruptive and sexually mature menstruating medium. Their bodies are children, but they are imbued with original sin as displayed through their menstrual maturity. Now, the idea of menstruation as a mediumistic trigger or catalyst is not an invention from within the pages of, of Stephen King Carey but was a real considered pathological theory of the late 19th century. Now, in many contemporaneous pseudoscientific and psychological investigations, doctors such as Frederick Roland Marvin argue that instances of professed mediumship occur, I quote, more frequently in women, especially at puberty or the menopausis. Now, speaking on the frequency of young female mediums, Marvin argued that such women were in the process of menstruation, which is interfered with. They are feeble and debilitated. Therefore, this suggests that the time frame of valid spiritual ability occurs in the period, pardon the pun, where the woman is fertile and of most use to a man and conventional familial structure. Now, sexually aware women, such as Sarah Waters' medium Selena Dawes in the book Affinity, are shown to be naturally predisposed to mediumship due to their maturity and uselessness to men. Now, the importance of physical female sexuality in investigative and reported accounts of 19th century mediumship is inherent, varied and widespread. There are several well-publicized reports of spiritualism being a mere development in the hysteria myth, whereby a woman's sexual urges and perceived needs are too great for her consciousness to process, whereby she enters a mentally limited state. One such believer in this extrapolation of hysteria was the aforementioned American physician, Frederick Roland Marvin. Now Marvin coined the term mediomania to apply to women suffering from what he perceived to be a mental and neurological condition whereby women believed that they could hold communion with the dead. 
He says in his 1874 lectures, The Pathology and Treatment of Media Mania, that the condition more frequently assails women and is usually preceded by a genito or venereopathological history. And he goes on to cite a case where a 23 year old woman of delicate habit was seeing visions of her dead son, whereby um, physical examination revealed retroversion of the uterus. Now, Marvin does not argue that female mediums are more deceptive, rather that their very gender brings about an unavoidable disability of sorts, predominantly caused by this physical disturbance of the sexual organs, namely abnormalities in their genitalia or reproductive system. The belief that mediumistic abilities had close relation to isolated feminine qualities was further compounded by attempts to pathologize the surge of claims of women reporting to be able to converse with spirits. Now, this adds to the argument that there is a direct correlation between female sexual legitimacy and fertility, both having a direct effect on a woman's perceived spiritual ability and wider mental health. As such, this makes them ideal, malleable tropes for Gothic and horror literature. When a young girl reaches puberty and menstruates, she is able to suddenly inhabit this role of the vengeful feminine as perfectly shown in Stephen King's Carrie. Now within Carrie, Carrie White, the innocent 17 year old female becomes corrupted by the arrival of her period and as such becomes a corruptive force. Her psychic powers become somewhat emboldened by her sudden new fertility and the very public acknowledgement of such. Now, when Carrie begins her period in the school's communal shower, she is mocked and pelted with sanitary products, all while she screams, believing that she's bleeding to death. Now, due to her mother's own extreme religious beliefs, she refused to educate her daughter as to these basic health and physical processes, heightening her naivety and innocence to the reader. Now, in Carrie, King furthers this interpretation of of uterine mediomania with pseudo official and third person medical reports, such as both medical and psychological writers on the subject are in agreement that Carrie White's exceptionally late and traumatic commencement of the menstrual cycle might well have provided the trigger for her latent psychic talent. Now this obsession with innocence and worldly naivety is a quality shared by so many young female Victorian mediums whose youth and perceived chastity was held in the highest regard by periodicals and newspapers alike. Take Florence Cook, Cora Scott, Nettie Coburn Maynard, who was Abraham Lincoln's preferred spiritualist, who were all discussed in prepubescent and childlike terms well into their 20s, using terms such as doll face, as I mentioned before, sweet, dainty, childlike, etc., acknowledging these women's psychic or mediumistic abilities as most valid was when these women were at their most childish. Now for Carrie, blood escalates her trauma and her powers, namely her telekinesis, which culminates in a literal baptism of blood on prom night, leading her heretofore preservative or defensive supernatural actions to escalate into vengeful, murderous incarnations. This, being Carrie, is the culmination of the, un of the ultimate unsupervised corruptive power of not only the taunted child, but of the sexually awakened female. I quote, she was unaware that she was scrubbing her bloodied hands against her dress like Lady Macbeth, or that she was weeping even as I laughed. Now, Similar young female mediums followed suit in a slew of pulp, uh, pulp bits of genre fiction and literature of the time, such as 1977's Ruby, which could be read as something of an escalation of the 1973 exorcist phenomenon. Now in Ruby, the young medium in question is a vulnerable young mute, and importantly, very delicate and beautiful, who is a natural medium whose destructive psychic abilities come at the age of 16, i.e. at menstruation and the cusp of adulthood. 
the tagline used to sell the book and film, which I think is currently free to watch on YouTube, um, was the very less than subtle, christened in blood, raised in sin, now she's sweet 16, let the party begin. Now phrases like this heighten the contemporary grindhouse presentation of the young medium and their inherent bodily exploitation, where they are seen as little more than fertile catalysts for a more powerful patriarchal or uncontrollable force rather than coming from within a nuanced individual. Similarly, 1977's The Spell depicts a 16 year old girl who uses telekinetic abilities to punish her bullies. These mediums are vengeful and feared through their threat to established patriarchal structures, namely channeling powers beyond their capabilities, being both damaging and weak in the same breath. Now, while such horror-centric young mediums are an extreme exploitative trope, this exploitation and disregard of bodily autonomy for female mediums of all ages is an unwelcome but established trait, once again, tracing back to 19th century working mediums. What we see today as novelty literary tropes are culturally ingrained realities, reinterpreted and twisted to fit entertainment needs, albeit once again through a somewhat patriarchal lens. Now, if we a quick look at Affinity. Now, in Sarah Waters' 1999 novel, Affinity, her protagonist is not a spiritualist, yet the central focus of her affection is a young female medium. Selena Dawes, who is incarcerated on grounds of fraud and assault, is a delicate and seemingly innocent young woman who corrupts the mentally fragile protagonist with emotional and spiritual machinations. Selena, by name alone, is a reference to Florence Cook's sister and predecessor, Kate Cook, whose middle name was none other than Selena. She too was renowned for being a very pretty, live, lively little girl which is not only reflected in Selena's depiction, but maintains the necessity of appealing descriptions of female mediumship. Affinity is sexually charged, a sapphic story of obsession between two mentally and importantly, physically delicate and vulnerable women, one of whom is othered and therefore corruptive thanks to her involvement with spiritualist mediumship. Selena's pale ethereal looks are both enticing and a contributing cause of her dangerous nature. Her youth and spiritual viability makes her a ticking time bomb, not a woman. So if we look at dangerous beauty and appearance in spiritualist mediumship, we can look at Victorian periodicals where discussions of appearance were published with as much frequency as spiritual successes. Now in 1871, a letter written to the editor of The Spiritualist recounts that during a seance involving table tipping and displays of spectral luminosity, a portion of Miss Cook's dress was removed and after being whisked in our faces was thrown over my head. Now in later seances, Florence and her protege Rosina both danced in gossamer thin dresses, which were not of note until such instances as the Volkman exposure of 1873, where the spirit manifestation was grabbed by a sitter and proven to be the medium herself, just in a white dress. Similarly, in 1880, when Florence Cook manifested Marie, the aforementioned gypsy, her corset caused suspicion as Marie was allegedly a child. And uh, Sir George Sitwell revealed the empty cabinet in which the medium was expected to sit throughout, revealing the spirit to be little other than Florence in her underwear. It's at this point that traditional societal gender standards and ideas Jane should, in theory, be applied to the seance. However, in this instance, upon finding Florence Florence's presentation half naked as a married woman. Now the, the eroticism of seance, the removal of the sense of self and the use of a woman as a vessel has become an overused trope in supernatural Gothic fiction. It's particularly prevalent 
in the aforementioned affinity, where seances incite a sense of sapphic sexual ecstasy, with lesbianism and spirit contact, contact rather, both being transgressive in 19th century society. However, Water's work is crafted from an entirely different cultural landscape in the literary environment of 1999, written accounts of same-sex attraction and non-heteronormative relationships were nuanced and broadly accepted by wider society, at the very least in terms of law. Subsequently, Water's work, while neo-Victorian in setting, is crafted within established contemporary social and emotional boundaries. Now, in Affinity, Zilla and Maud, the female body, once imbued with the power to command a room, is a tool for destruction and for moral collapse. In Affinity, this is via a heart attack, in Maud, the death of a child, and in both Zilla and Carrie, the death of near enough everyone. Now, so <clears throat> through my understanding of Victorian spiritualist discourse surrounding female mediums, one belief is inherently clear throughout, and that is a woman interacting with such complex fields as theology and the eternal spirit will all result in the same horrific ending. In the cases of Guppy, Cook, Zilla and Maud, um, I found this conclusion to be unavoidable, however ugly, beautiful or successful they may have been. But why do we continue to see these same mediumistic tropes in literature and genre fiction? Because hundreds of years later, the powerful, spiritually aware woman is still seen as a subversion of the natural order of things. It's because of the high stations of female mediums and psychics that Gothic and horror literary outlets still reach for these women as narrative keystones. Because after all, they're has never been and there will never be anything more feared than a woman in position of power. Thank you very much. And that's all my socials. If you want to hear me prattle on about more dead mediums on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and I have a Patreon as well. So check it out if you're so inclined. Thank, you, thank you ever so much. So before we get Dave Syria has just met starting on menstruation, which will take us into the work of Michelet and the 19th century French author and various things like that. And no doubt all those questions will flow in a moment. Let's start with a first question for Kay, if I may. Um, Dr. Cheryl, uh, Cheryl, you obviously have spent a great deal of time dealing with separate spheres ideology and women in the Victorian era. How do you think things have changed? Have we actually put to bed separate spheres ideology or are women still banished to the private?